We are reading this morning from Pastor Shiva, Lesson 50. How do we treat the environment? The Hindu tradition understands that man is not separate from nature, that we are linked by spiritual, psychological, and physical bonds with the elements around us. Knowing that the divine is present everywhere and in all things, Hindus hold a deep reverence for life. We hold an awareness that the great forces of nature, the earth, the water, the fire, the air, and space, as well as all the various orders of life, including plants and trees, forests and animals, are bound to each other within life's cosmic web. Our beloved earth, so touchingly looked upon in our scriptures as Bhumi Devi, the earth goddess, has nurtured mankind through millions of years of growth and evolution. However, the earth's large population, its industries, automobiles, and lifestyle are causing significant damage to the environment. As one-sixth of the human family, Hindus can have a tremendous impact we should take the lead in earth-friendly living, personal frugality, lower power consumption, alternative energy, sustainable food production, and vegetarianism. All of Earth's diversity is to be cared for, from the soil, water, and air, to the plants and animals of every shape and kind. To achieve this, we practice restraint in the use of the Earth's resources. We do not exploit its minerals, water, fuels, or soil. We avoid polluting our blue planet. We work to protect the many endangered plants and animals. We do not buy or use products from exploited species such as furs, ivory, or reptile skin. We recycle paper, glass, metal, and plastic, and use efficient means of transportation that save on energy. We plant trees and do not waste food. In these ways, we express the fundamental Hindu reverence for the earth and all life upon it. Then we have Gurudeva's quote. Hinduism offers a unified vision of man and nature in which there is reverence, not dominion or carelessness. Mother Earth, sustainer of life, is a key Vedic idea. All Hindus feel they are guests on the planet with responsibilities to nature, which when fulfilled, balance its responsibilities to them. The physical body was gathered from nature and returns to it. The Tudukara has a chapter that relates, chapter two, the importance of rain. Give you a quiz first. What are the first four chapters of the Tudukara? Who remembers? It's the foremost, it's what the author, Tiruvalavar, thinks are the four most important things. Okay. <laughs> yes, that's one of them. No, oh, God, of course, would be first. That's got to put God first in Hindu scripture, right? <laughs> God will vault to. Um, second is the importance of rain. And third, you may have forgotten. The greatness of renunciates. Right, right. He doesn't say the greatness of doctors, the greatness of IT engineers. <laughs> the greatness of renunciates. Different perspective on importance of the uh, professions back then. And the last one is dharma or aram. 
strengthening dharma. So those are the four ideas that Tudor thinks are the most important, and he puts them first in his introduction. When ecology isn't working right, one of the first things that happens is we don't have enough water around, <laughs> like California. <laughs> Go to California and see reservoirs that used to be full and now they're empty, and landscapes that used to have plants or don't have any plants anymore. So it's definitely uh, one example of something that's water challenged. Fortunately, we live, live on Kauai, and we don't have that problem. That things would have to really, really change <laughs> for us to be short on water. But it, rain is actually going down. If you look at the statistics, um, say 50 years ago, it used to rain more than it does now in the whole state of Hawaii. It's an interesting statistic. And temperature's going up and rain is coming down in a very slow manner. But we have no worry. It's interesting, I, uh, on, on my 72nd birthday, the monks surprised me. They started walking me out to the pasture of all things, you know. <laughs> I said, what's up? <laughs> Maybe we have a new car. <laughs> what would be out in the pasture? And so we got out to the pasture, and all the monks were there, and sat around for a few minutes, and then a helicopter landed. <laughs> so they gave me a helicopter ride around the island as a 72nd birthday present. And then I said, well, when's the next one? And he said, well, you have to be 144 <laughs> to get your next one. <laughs> But why do I bring this up? It relates to rain. That, I'm actually uh, on the same point. <clears throat> the helicopter pilot, almost the driver, the helicopter pilot, went into the canyons. It's a special routing. Usually you, you go, you know, up, go around, you go up above Koke, and then you come down uh, Nepali coast and things. But he... He specialized for some reason on the canyons, so he would, which there's quite a few of, and you would go into a canyon quite a ways, and what would you see? You'd always see a very tall waterfall. So we have waterfalls around the whole island in these canyons, and what are they doing? They're functioning every day of the year because there's enough rain. They don't turn off like our river doesn't go away. <laughs> But we have waterfalls because of the amount of rain on top of the mountain. The waterfalls all around the island, so it's like an abhishekam. I was, that's what I was thinking. Like the whole island is receiving abhishekam, and it's coming down on all these different sides. It was a very interesting feeling. How many places have water coming down on all sides at all times? You know, probably very few. Maybe some place in Bali has that. Chapter 2, back to the Tirukkara. Just a few of the verses. There's ten. Just read three of them. They touch on different aspects. It is the unfailing fall of rain that sustains the world. Therefore, look upon rain as the nectar of life. So when you don't have rain, you really appreciate that. Rain is the nectar of life. Amrit, amrita. When clouds withhold their watery wealth, farmers cease to ply their plows. There's no point in farming if there's no water. Should the heavens dry up, worship here of the heavenly ones in festivals and daily rites would wither. So not only does it impact Food, eventually it impacts all activity, which includes temple worship. So temple worship depends upon the presence of, of rain. Then we have a verse, Shukla Yajurveda. To the heavens be peace, to the sky 
and the earth. To the waters be peace, to plants and all trees. To the gods be peace, to Brahman be peace, to all men be peace, again and again, peace also to me. This brings out a quality in Hindu prayers versus prayers of other traditions. Hindu prayers don't stop with people. Of course, all prayers talk about people. May people be peaceful, may people have this, may people have that. But Hindu prayers include animals, and this one shows we're including plants and all trees and the water itself. So it's bringing in other forms of life we're praying for, as well as the earth and the water, the elements. It's right in the prayers. This, this idea of caring for the environment is found right in our various prayers, going back all the way to the Vedas. One of the <clears throat> advantages of places with fewer people is you can control things. Singapore is a good example. Of course, Hawaii is, which is the one I'll get to in a second, but Singapore is small enough that you can actually control uh, things like littering <laughs> in a very tight way. And, and the joke in Singapore is everything is fine in Singapore if you put a paper on the ground, there's a fine. If you do this, there's a fine. If you do that, there's a fine. Everything is a fine. <laughs> but you can control things because it's small. Well, Hawaii is small also and has an opportunity, therefore, to control the environment in a tighter way than many places do. And I don't think we've done a lot so far, but one of the initiatives by the governor um, is for electricity to all come from renewable resources by 2045. That's, it's, a, it's a law. It's not just a wish. It's a law. So all the generators of electricity in Hawaii need to comply by this by 2045. So renewables, what does renewables mean? Renewables, of course, includes solar, wind, water, but it also includes something you can renew, which is a tree. So when you take, when you use oil from the ground, you can't put it back. You can't make more oil. <laughs> it's not a renewable resource. Whereas if you burn a tree, when you cut down the tree, you can plant a new one. It's renewable. So a, a portion of the Energy comes from burning trees, and we have that activity going on on Kauai. Oh, that's wonderful, isn't it? 100% from renewable, whereas when we started maybe a decade ago, there's very little from renewable. It's all, almost all from importing diesel. So we have to import diesel from California, ship it some 2,500 miles, and then burn it. <laughs> Very inefficient, but um, Kauai is doing very well in terms of solar and renewable resources. It's put in a huge amount. I think it's when the next solar field goes online, I'm not sure if it has already, it, we're up to 60% renewables. 60%. And the power company, KIUC, its goal is 70% by. 2030, so they're ahead of their <coughs> official goal, which is very nice. But by 2045, we can look forward to the whole state being on renewables, and we don't have to import diesel from other places for electricity. That doesn't apply to automobiles and trucks. It's, it's a ruling that just applies to the generation of electricity, but it's a start. Maybe the next ruling will be about automobiles. <laughs> but the point is, it, to make a significant, we can all do something to help 
the environment. We have lots of initiatives here. We grow a lot of our own food. We have our solar. We have an electric car. But for there to be a huge impact, the whole society has to do the same thing together. And so when the governor makes a law, then that helps society move in a unified way, kind of like Singapore. <laughs> All moving the same direction. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful day.